Peter Chaudy. I'm the chairman of Creative University. Joining me today is a very a special, special guest, Glenn Fogel, who's the CEO of Booking Holdings and Booking.com. Correct, Glenn? Did I say that right? You got it absolutely right. Okay. This time I got it right before I didn't get it right. But today is going to be a, a, a really interesting and candid look. Glenn, I'm going to keep it candid, keeping it real with you. Uh, Glenn's personal and professional journey, how he got from out of the womb and into the chair that he is right now, which is not actually the actual chair he usually is as CEO of a $100 billion company, but it is what it is and how he deals with it. But we'll also like ask him about, yes, how the biggest travel um, company in the, in the world on the planet deals with a situation like the worst possible scenario where everything shuts down in his industry, all when we're locked in for the first time on a global basis in human history. And he has the good fortune of running the travel company where it's all about being outside the home. So I'll, we'll talk about all that good stuff, but Glenn, I'm gonna give a, for, so welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. Good seeing so, you. So I'm gonna give a, a brief formal intro so people understand a little bit. Um, but I think most people can kind of get a sense that we've known each other for a while. So Glenn and I went to school together back in the day and we're very close friends then and continue to be to this day. And um, Glenn is a true innovator. Uh, I would say a fearless guy who did a lot of things that were ahead of its time. And that was one of the reasons why he got into the chair he is today, but also just a hilarious, good guy, fun loving, um, all kinds of things that we'll talk about and you'll get a sense of. So Glenn, I, yes, you can pay me. You can pay me for, <laughs> for, gush, for gushing over you. So Glenn is, as I said, CEO of Booking Holdings, which is the parent to Booking and Booking.com. But Booking Holdings is the parent to Booking.com, Priceline, Kayak, Open Table, which, by the way, I, I, I had no idea that was the case, um, Agoda, which I'm not familiar with, Rentalcars.com. And as of this morning, when I checked, Booking Holding is nearly a $100 billion company. Um, he's held that position since 2019, um, but he's been with Booking slash Priceline from 2000, from 2000? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I try not to tell people about it, but yeah, 20, more than 21 years. Which is crazy. That's very rare, of course, in the work, workplace in any industry today. So he was there from the very beginnings. Before that, he was a trader in a global asset management firm. And before that, he was an investment banker who, not surprisingly, was specializing in air transportation, apparently. Again, we were close friends and our close friends, I didn't know that. I had no idea. Um, he's a graduate of Harvard Law. That's where we got to know each other and earned a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the Wharton School of Business. So, you know, a decent pedigree, decent pedigree for this guy. And uh, one of the things before we get into the interview, I recall vividly in, I th in the 90s, you sent me a script once during a period of retirement, I think that's what you called it. So you were doing your thing before Priceline, you went into retirement mode a little a little bit uh, and you sent me a script because you knew I was in the industry and you said like, what did you think about it? So all these things that Glenn is, but I remember it was a damn good script. It was an action script if I remember correctly, but it was, it was really, really good. So, Multifaceted guy, Glenn. How do you explain all that? Well, first of all, we have to correct some things. And here's something that's really important. As one ages, one's memory becomes faulty. Oh, here we go. So actually, it was a novel, not a screenplay. It wasn't an action script. But, uh, and this is what's important here. And let's cut this. I was in retirement because that was a kind way to say I'd been fired and lost my job. So let's let's cut straight to the chase. I, I'd been fired. I wasn't working. It was hard to get a job. And I decided at that time in my life, I wanted to try something different. So I went and I wrote it. And uh, long story short, I am now having nothing to do with being a writer. <laughs> I run a travel company. But interesting how things work out. 
Okay, so I got it a little bit wrong, but I remember, <laughs> but I do remember that I liked it. So, but again, multi-layered guy, I'll put it that way, multi-layered guy who ultimately, I remember then, okay, my, hopefully my memory is correct here, where I was sitting around and doing my thing and all of a sudden you get a phone call from Glenn and he, he goes to a place called Priceline and this is back in 2000, right? Yep, yep. In 2000. 2000. And this is where, when Captain Kirk was, I think he was already doing the Priceline ads, <clears throat> but still it was very, very early days, very early days. So take us into, let's start from the beginning, Glenn, of like probably from law school um, and where you went really quickly, you know, brief stops along the way, including your own personal adversity and how that impacted you and going forward from there. Just take us yeah. through that. So why don't we, let me just start, um, and we can come back to pre-college, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's just go a little faster. So I graduated college, and I took a job in the information technology, IT, tech stuff at a bank called Morgan Stanley, uh, really knowing very little about computers and being a, a developer. And this is in the um, early 80s, and I was really bad at it. And I decided I better do something else. And those investment bankers at Morgan Stanley were making all the money. It was incredible. It was a hot thing. I wanted to do that. But you can't do that just being an IT guy. So I figured I had to get another job. I had to go back do something. I went to Harvard Law School. Met you, Peter. It was great, fun. And then I came out, instead of being a lawyer, I went to an investment bank. And I did that for a number of years until- Let me, let, let yeah. me stop you there just for a second. Okay, yeah. so when you went to law school, because when we were there, we never really talked about what we were going to do afterwards. At least I don't recall doing that. But the general path for people was to go to uh, leave law school and have some kind of legal career. So what led you to immediately out of law school decide not to go that path? Well, you know, I went to Harvard Law School wanting to be an investment banker. I already had the business degree from Wharton, as you mentioned. So I already had that. And it's going to be paying my own money. I didn't want to spend the money to get an MBA. So yeah. I went to law because that was another route, a little bit harder to get the job, but I went that way thinking I'd actually get some value. Also, it was three years in law school instead of two years of business school. I mean, that's another year of not working. It could be, it could be more enjoyable. Yes. So I did that and I got the job as an investment banker and I did it at a place called Kidder Peabody and it went under, essentially got bought um, by another company and this is now the you know, early nine, 1994, 95. And unfortunately, what that meant was, is that a lot of people get fired in M&A deals. They you know, save money by firing a whole bunch and I got fired. So now I don't have a job. And that's when I decided, well, I'm gonna be a writer instead. I always wanna be a writer, I'm gonna write. And um, as you know, I got some of the best rejection letters in the world. I mean, really, really well-written rejection letters, not form stuff. I mean, some people went out of the way that I remember one, derivative and not very interesting, I think was one of the, one of them. So I'm glad you like it, Peter. Well, at least it was personally done though. Yeah, yeah, people went out of the way to be yeah. <laughs> to be. Yeah. And so, and one of the things is, um, so I, I was single at the time and somebody set me up with a woman who had previously been an editor at Random House. And, and she and I weren't, you know, I'm not sure how, it wasn't that great at the beginning, the first date, but I figured, you know, this is an entree into getting it published. So we had a second date and the third date, I bring her the manuscript. Cause I know this is kind of like an end and I, and she sees the manuscript in the box. She knows exactly what it is. And she just, she thinks like I'm carrying dog crap. That's how much she doesn't want it. But I ask her, Liz, can you just take a look? And she takes, it was a brunch date. And I walk away thinking, well, I just killed a whole bunch of trees printing out this book. And what a waste that was. I'm feeling a little bit bummed and depressed. And I get a call from her and she says, hey, this isn't that bad. And I'm like, yes, this is all gonna work out great. There is the a ringing story, endorsement. Yeah, and at the end of the story, is so, though um, Amy is her name, um, it doesn't get published, but we do get married. I got two great uh, kids, uh, uh, so uh, it was aptly worth it. So while she's trying to so, sell it- So it, who yeah. knows, who knows if that would have all happened if you went to brunch with her, but didn't have the manuscript with you. 
You know, who knows? My my life would be so different right now. You have no idea. And absolutely for the worst, I'm pretty sure, though, you never know chaos theory and all. But so what happened? You are very fortunate to be with Amy. There's no question. I am incredibly lucky. Are you kidding me? I'm the luckiest man in the world. Yeah. So what what happened is, is so we're trying to say she's trying to use all her contacts and stuff, but nobody's biting on the book. And she says, you know, if this release is going to go forward, you should probably get a job. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I should. But now I've been a couple of years not working. And what am I going to do? So what do you do? You call up a friend. And I call this friend who we both know, Rob Meyer, who was a big shot at Morgan Stanley, yeah. Morgan Stanley. And he says, well, um, I got a, there's a job here for trading. Do you want to do that? And I said, I've never traded anything. He's like, ah, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And that kind of explains 2008 so well. It's yeah, yeah. letting people like me come into it. But so I take that job and I'm doing that, but I'm not doing it. It's not great. And now it's the late 90s. And I want, and the internet is just really beginning to boom. And I want to get out of this trading thing and go back to doing deals, and, which I did as an investment banker. And Amy has a friend, and that friend's a lawyer who's doing work for this company called Priceline in Connecticut. Not I'm living in New York City. And so she talks to him. He says, yeah, there's a job to do deals. You want to check it out? I said, sure. So I got the job because of Amy, because of a friend of her. And I started so, working. So, so Priceline to you, it's not like you were seeking out that industry or anything like that. It was kind of not serendipity, but it was certainly more along that path. Uh, okay, here's an opportunity through a relationship that you had. And that led to your entree into Priceline. So I was looking for a job into the internet world, the digital world at the time, 1999. Okay. And I'm interviewing different firms in New York City that are doing it. But there's nobody who's really big. The only one who was big was Priceline that went public in the spring and now it's the uh, fall of 1999. And I'm like, and that's where the connection was. But your point of serendipity is so right, Peter. I mean, think about all the things that had to happen to make me where I was at that point. So I get the job, but I don't want to start before I get my bonus for 1999, which gets paid into two, early 2000. So I get my bonus from Morgan Stanley. I say, thank you very much. I'm going over to Priceline. And that was one week before the peak of the NASDAQ in March of 2000, which proved I was a lousy trader. And it was good for me to leave my trading job having just top ticked the internet in 2000, going long internet in March of 2000, with the worst trade ever. And I came into it, the stock was at $50 a share. And in a week, it went over 100. I'm thinking like, yes, my options, this is so great, it's wonderful. Well. Nine months later, it's trading for less than a dollar. Yeah. And everybody thinks Priceline's going to go under yeah. and disappear. So, you know, it was like, oh God, what a mistake that was. And yet, 20 years later, 2021, worked out okay. Yeah, it worked out okay. It worked out. By the way, too, so everybody, feel free to ask your questions of Glenn. We're going to get to those at the end of the hour. But put them in the chat box, at, which is going to be on your screen someplace, and then I'll get to those. Um, but a, a couple of things there. The power of relationships. So everybody, we talk about that all the time, where I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about, well, a couple lessons here. A lot of times, you're, you all are sitting in a, in a place, in a, and you feel, some of you may feel you have to have your life all figured out. Like you have a path where you need to get to, and there's a certain... A to B to B to C and so on and so forth. Glenn is a, a yet another example of that is rarely the way life works out. And you hear this time and time again. So take some of that pressure off yourself, take action, but, but you're, whatever you think your life is going to be, it's not going to be that way. And I'll say that very like without hesitation. And another thing is the power of relationships, which we talk about all the time. I think a lot of people think that like, they're going to get a job or an opportunity through a headhunter. That may happen, but the greater odds, the far greater odds are that a relationship of some kind will lead you to your first step and then may lead you to your second step and so on and so forth and define your, help you define your career and get the path you want to. And sometimes they're kind of like personal relationship serendipity, but establish that relationship. 
take time to foster those relationships. And then Glenn, I just gotta say two more things then I'll be quiet because it's an interview about you. Um, but you know me well enough. <laughs> no, but two things. You mentioned that work essentially, your novel, your manuscript led you to your wife. So you kind of your job led you to your wife. Just serendipity, my, my job when I was representing NWA, the rap group led me to my wife. And so it's kind of funny there. And then um, in terms of like opportunities and, and oh, when you got into the internet in 2000, that's exactly when I entered the, the internet 2000. I joined a company that was just about to go public. And so I was greedy at the time. So I joined that company. It was digital greeting cards. And two months later, it crashed and burned. And like, so I left Universal Studios, went, went into this. And I remember my wife still gives me a hard time about it. Like, what were you thinking? Universal to digital greeting cards. But in any event, it ended up where, where I am today in terms of the life that I want to lead. And so like, it ultimately works out people. Don't ever think that like, it's a mistake that's intractable, but that's enough of that. So keep going with your journey. No, but that's such an important thing you just said, Peter. Let's this is underline some of these things. So first thing is that you to increase your chances, your probability of things working out the way you want. And there are a couple of things. Certainly, developing relationships by far, probably absolutely number one. Not what you know, who you know. That's a cliche, but it's called a cliche for a reason. It's true. And yeah. you and I both had professors at law school at Harvard who said. Building your relationships now is one of the critical things for, you know, every throughout your life. And you should do that all the time. And actually, it's kind of fun meeting new people, maintaining relationships. That's what human life is about, is being with people. So don't hesitate to, doing that. That's absolutely important. Second thing is the whole idea of luck, though, and serendipity and all that. You and I both know this now, how important that is. Sometimes people don't realize that. Sometimes they blame themselves when things go wrong. You know? that many times it's not you it's things you had zero control over because most of your life you had zero control over where i am right now is maybe one little part because i worked really really hard and i try to increase my odds by meeting people and all that so much more i look how did my parents meet that was luck i wouldn't be me but without that and yeah. then what where do they oh, so many things like that no no exactly no but that's so true i mean the one thing about that because it is important for everybody to really internalize that because I know a lot of you out there put a lot of pressure on yourselves, especially during these times when we're all locked in. I mean, Glenn, we'll talk about that. You're working from your home running this company that has, I don't even know how many thousands of people in it, but just doing that. And so all of you are locked in your homes trying to think of, oh man, what happened to my opportunities? Well, establishing relationships in the best possible way you can even during these times by reaching out, being activists. And I guess that's the one piece of advice. Put yourself in the best possible situation to allow serendipity to happen. Because if you are active and put yourself out there, then the more you do that, of course, the more opportunity there is for serendipity, positive serendipity to happen to you. So taking action is what you can control. Yeah, and you can part of you know, the old saying, well, another cliche about uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And there's a lot to that. And I, I just, I can't say how important that is. So I work really, really hard. A lot of people say I work harder than anybody they know. And even now, I'm working harder now, almost 60 years old than I've ever worked in my life. And obviously because of this pandemic crisis and being in the travel industry, it is still a crisis. But I know for a fact that working really hard increased the probabilities that things would work out in the end for me. And the other thing is, and this is so important too, we've all had setbacks. I, you know, I got fired. That's a setback. I, and you mentioned earlier, I was as a, in high school as a junior, everything was going fairly well for me. And I take the SATs, I think I'm going to go to good college. And then I had a, stroke that paralyzed me on my entire right side left hemisphere stroke it destroyed my ability to speak i couldn't read i couldn't write everything was so great went to almost nothing really and that was in 1979 and it was nine years later i was able to graduate with peter from harvard law school so things can be really horrible but things can come back 
and you have to be willing to accept that life's going to have a bunch of bad events. That's life. Everybody's going to have, we all have, some people watching have already had a bunch. Some people fortunately have not had them yet, but everybody gets them. And how you can recover from it, how you deal with adversity will be the difference between whether or not it sets you back forever or you come back and go on to even better and more fun things. So Glenn, how did you deal with that as a young man in 1979 when that happened? And, you know, you're a really young guy and it's, it's still mind blowing to me that you had that kind of experience. How did you deal with that at the time and how, if any way, did it change the way of thinking about how you approached your future? It affected me badly. <laughs> well. I, my personality was not one that was good for that time of event to happen. Easily frustrated, easily, easy anger, not good, not good at all. Um, and it was hard. And coming back from when you thought of yourself as one person, now you're entirely a different person. You thought you were a smart person, now you're not a smart person, and all sorts of things like that. But I always had had a lot of self discipline. And that was what I used to be really self discipline. I continue to do that. I work out every day. I never miss a day of not working out. Even when I'm on a plane, when, I, when we used to be able to fly internationally. You know, right, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I fly to Asia and you lose a day going from the US to Asia, you miss a day, it just disappears on the calendar because the date fell. But you don't want to miss the day. So you try and do some exercise on the plane. I assure you, nobody likes it. When you get up in the aisles and you start doing exercise. Don't tell me you were doing push-ups in the, in the aisles. Please. I would go to the galley to do those. No, you wouldn't. Oh, yeah. On those floors on planes. That's that's nice. But the floors but are it, fine. They clean up. But it gets it to uh, before we started the session, I was telling Glenn how ripped he looks and that he's trying to catch up to Jeff Bezos in terms of, you know, just overall that. And that's why I that's why I wear these loose hoodies. So I like I hide all that. But oh, I wear, I'm wearing this not because because I just wear it because I got the logo. That's why I would have worn it. <laughs> um, but you were telling me about that too. That um, you are you are working harder now, even though you're remote. And so conceptually, you should be saving time because you're not traveling to the office. But you're working harder than ever now, and actually working out less than you were before. So yeah, why is that? Well, look, it's been a very hard time for everybody. Everybody around the world has been terribly affected by this crisis of this pandemic. And the travel industry has probably been hurt more than any other industry, uh, I would think. And look, we have had a lot, of, a lot of things we've had to get through. Unfortunately, we had to let go almost 25%, it's 23% of our employees. So we still have still a little more than 20,000 employees, but we had to say goodbye to a lot of people through no fault of their own. And that's, again, goes back to this issue. People, well, why am I being fired, right? Well, it's, you didn't do a bad job. You weren't a bad worker. It's not your fault, but because businesses is the way they are, you have to adjust the size of your company to the business you have. And these things take a lot of time. And so many elements that we're doing, trying to make sure that we are optimizing our company for the future, because we know we're gonna get through this again. When this whole thing started, I'm talking to our 27,000 of the time employees around the world and trying and reassuring them that this is horrible, I know, but we will get through this. The world will not end. It will get through. And people, they're like, especially if it's the first time you've been through a crisis, it can be very, very hard on people. I've been through a bunch. I had my stroke. I've been fired. I, the internet bubble blew up right after I came there. I was like, hey. Been there, seen it. Don't worry, we'll get through so, this. So, Glenn, and I cut you off before about that because you talked about how you felt at the time when you had your stroke. But mm -hmm. did that did that change the way you kind of thought about your future, and and has led you to that kind of resilience yeah. that you're talking about when you're faced with adversity? Well, there's definitely an element of having been there before. You are better prepared for the crisis the next time. And when I went, when I did go off to a college. I worked incredibly hard because I wanted to make sure, could I still be as good? Could I still do be as smart or not? And I didn't have a lot of fun in college. I did not enjoy it as the way many people enjoy college, a fun time. I was working my ass off. 
Now, I also graduated early. I graduated in three and a half years, saved my money, um, uh, saved money you know, from my parents, made it less expensive, and then went right to work. But that was also a little element of my, I want to go to law school. Yes, so I get a job in investment bank, but it's also a little bit of like, I want to do what other people didn't have a fun time. And theater, I thank you again, because you were a leader in having fun in law school. Don't worry, <laughs> it's all secret with me, but I do have the records. I definitely took the pressure off myself and tried to be at the top of the class, and and I succeeded. And yeah, I said, you did that. You did well, that. You're not supposed to like emphasize that. But that's coming from me. You don't have to I, like underscore that. <laughs> I just thank I just thank God that Michelle Obama, you know, uh, did something good, so our class is not complete filled with failures. Yeah. By the way, that's a very cool thing. So we have Michelle Obama was a classmate of ours, which is and, pretty and Jennifer and Jennifer Graham was uh, the year ahead or behind us, who's now the secretary of was a former Michigan governor, now the secretary of something. I don't remember what she's secretary something. She just got a cabinet position. I don't know. Well, and I got to say, and with all due respect to my good friend here, Glenn, Glenn Fogel, um, when we were together in law school at the time, I guess I wouldn't have anticipated that you'd be sitting in, in the chair running a hundred billion dollar company because we never thought that way. It was just, we did have a good time, but let's let's move beyond and our reminiscing of the past. Yes, okay? let's move beyond. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it's fascinating to everybody out there. But, let, okay, so you go through your career and you're, um, and I wanna ask you about just the lifestyle too, as you were the head of deals and, globe trotting all around the world and you still when you could you still have to because you're a global agency with tens of thousands of people i want to ask you about that and how that impacts you and your personal life um because i think that's gonna be interesting for people to hear too but the pandemic hits you are a travel company it is the worst possible crisis where everything comes to a standstill i mean today you're you're at your market highs which is insane but at that time the world falls apart for you. You're running this thing with tens of thousands of people. I remember calling you like right after it was lockdown and asking you, Glenn, how are you dealing with this? And you were very just kind of stoic about it. But that happens. What do you do as CEO of a company? So right away, when it first happened, I first saw this happen, it began to happen. It was end of December maybe yeah right about end of December and because we have big operation in China we about a thousand people at the time in China and all of a sudden we're hearing from them listen there's this issue potentially and we're like hmm this isn't good now it's early January and end of January we always have an annual meeting in Amsterdam we bring 10 15 thousand people of our employees around the world come to Amsterdam for a big big meeting we every and we're thinking now this early January we're saying gee maybe we shouldn't have our colleagues from China come because who knows what's happening and we decide no they can't come because it was you know they felt very sad and they couldn't come but it really hadn't hit the press and it wasn't really big in the U.S. yet this is early January but we're like uh oh this could not be good and what I'm thinking is I'm thinking SARS because I've been through already with the SARS issues back in 2003, when our Asia business collapsed there because travel stopped there. And it was very similar. So we had a little bit of a, you know, hmm, is this gonna be like that? Or is it gonna be not as bad or it will be even worse? So you're trying to figure it out. And then once we saw what happened in Italy, which was in mid-February and so we're like, uh-oh, break the glass, new yeah. thing. We got to move 27,000 employees from working in offices to everybody's got to work from home. And it's not, think about it, how much we have over 10,000 people who are customer service people working in call centers around the world and telling these people, hi, we want you to do this all from home now. Here's a laptop. Let's see what we can do. And the volume at the time was off the chart. We never had customer service volume like that because everybody wants to cancel because you can't, you can't try, you know, so it was just chaos and we're running how much cash do we have because there's not only is there zero revenue you're talking about maybe negative revenue negative revenue is an interesting concept you're funding more than you have coming in it's not a good look for a business and when you think how long can we last and so so you think that but you gotta you gotta be calm other people are looking to you should i be scared or not so if you're not showing fear maybe they won't show fear Inside, you're going to bed and you think, 
hmm, wonder how this is going to turn out for us. <laughs> okay, but that sounds um, like I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine the stress that you're under when you have all these lives that are dependent upon their jobs. So you know that. You, uh, obviously, you understand that as CEO of such a massive company. This thing hits you. You kind of keep it to yourself because you got to show strength. And I totally get that. But how do you, I guess, what are the, what are the guiding principles that led you at the time as CEO of the company? So you can't do it all. You can't, you know, you have to rely upon your team. So did you establish certain like principles that, uh, that were part of the ethos of your company that you, you told, you know, you laid out to the various employees and, you know, describe that a little bit, how you thought about your top management um, and your expectations of them to get you through, but also how you yourself personally dealt with that. So one of the things you really want to be is transparent as much as you can be. And while I say, yes, yeah, sometimes I think, hmm, I wonder how this is going to come out. I was very confident about the long-term future because we had a lot of cash. And I felt that we would be able to weather the storm, so to speak, better than anybody. In fact, and you'd never want to win this way. You don't want your competitor to break their leg when you're in a race. But essentially, because we have more capital and because we're bigger, we, I felt very confident that the possibility we'd not only come out of this well, we come out even better because our competitors would be more damaged. Um, but what you do is you're, we had a daily crisis meeting with the senior management, seeing uh, what are you up to, who's doing what, which person's doing which thing. And then there are multiple uh, crisis committees below that in different areas. How do you handle getting people into working from home? How are you dealing with other types of safety things? How are you going to deal with customers who need refunds? All these things. And then you're gathering all up. And each week having a broadcast to the employees, tell them, oh, here's where we are. Here's what's happening. Here's what we expect and why I think it's all going to work out. And there was, I believe it was probably, I'd have to look back, I'll bet in the March, early April, when I first started talking about, I believe we'll have vaccines within a year at the latest, possibly sooner, that will get us through this. And lo and behold, it did happen pretty much as we hoped. Yeah. But, how, okay, so let's talk about, how about the customer? How did you feel about the customers who were inundating you with calls for refunds and how to deal with yeah. like setting policies about all that kind of thing. It's a horrible situation because and, uh, let's say you have a traveler, a, a person who is going to go from LA was planning to take a holiday in Italy and they had set it all up. And now the Italian government says, nobody can come to Italy on tourism. It's too damn, we don't want anybody coming. So the customer has bought a non-refundable trip. And they're saying, but I can't come. They won't let me come. Or I lost my job because you know how many people around the world lost their jobs in the spring there? You know, millions and millions. So you have a person talking to a customer service person who's home pleading, please, I need my money back. Meanwhile, there's nobody in the hotel to talk to because the hotels are shut down in Italy yeah. because the government shut everything down. Yeah. Or or you can reach the hotel per people and they say, look, we're not refunding. We don't have, we need to keep our cash so we can stay alive. We're not refunding, you know, we're just not doing it. So what we made the decision is we said, we'll take the money out of our own pocket and we'll give it to that desperate customer. And we will later on try and get the money back from the hotels. And we did that. We were not legally required to do this at all, but we did it because it was the right thing to do. And we did it. It cost us tens and tens of millions of dollars, huge amount of money. But we did it because in terms of a relationship with your customer, you want to stand by, even though we weren't, didn't have to, to create that arrangement, that, that feeling that you were there for them. So we did it. And that came from you. I mean, that comes from the top. Yeah, at the end of the day, I'm going to say, okay, because you know, our shareholders may not agree why are you giving away the money's cash when you're not legally obligated to give away the tens of millions of dollars to people? And yeah. by the way, are we going to have enough money ourselves? The same way the hoteliers are thinking that way. So yeah, it's one of those things. You just have to make the decision. Look, a lot of places didn't do that. A lot of companies said, sorry, not, our, not us. You know, you got to talk to the hotel and get the money from them. Um, here's their telephone number. Enjoy. Yeah. A lot of people did that. We didn't do that. 
Well, and ultimately look at where you're sitting. Again, you're a hundred billion dollar company uh, at 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 or near your highs, which is yeah. a, it's a testament to those kinds of things because brand matters. You know, goodwill matters. Okay, so let's talk about you though. Let's talk about how you you mentioned it a little bit, but how do you, Glenn, deal with that where you have to show the strength? As, you have to be a leader. Uh, so inside your head's churning because I know your head churns. Uh, so. So how do you deal with it? Well, well part lessons, of it is, like lessons to be learned for, you know, for the, for well, the young recognize, people. Uh, recognizing these things, there's nothing wrong with feeling sad about things. There's nothing wrong about feeling this sucks. It's like, wow, man, this isn't good. It's okay to feel that way. But always have a sense of, well, think about the upside. Where's the, you know, is there something good? What's the positive? Be sure you can relay that to other people. People are looking for optimism. Franklin Roosevelt, in you know the desperate parts of the early part of 1942, after the U.S. had been you know bombed in Pearl Harbor and everything was going wrong in the war, he wasn't going on the radio and telling people, "Well, this is all going to hell. I think we're probably going to lose this war. I don't know. And, you know, I'm just got my day till I'm out of here. And, well, I hope there's a good pension in this." No, he was talking about how to think about Churchill. Yeah. Think about Churchill's speeches. When you, the UK, England stood alone, alone against uh, the Nazis by themselves and everything was going to hell. Look what he was going through. Dunkirk, I hope you all saw that movie, good movie, but think about the environment of what it was. And he wasn't saying, oh, it's all lost. He wasn't a defeatist like many in his cabinet were who said, let's kind of deal with her Hitler. He was saying, screw that. And yeah. here's why, you know, we'll fight him on the beaches. We'll fight him in the hills. That's what you want to do. Give them a sense of what you're living for. Well, uh, exactly. And w another thing you said that the way that you were with your own team to that point is that that doesn't mean that you sugarcoat it. Like Churchill is renowned for, he tells it like it is, like the, the, the brutal truth, but with what you just said, with uh, like, we're a team, we're in this together. This is, the, this is your reality, people. This is it. And so you got to lay the facts out there, at least to a certain extent, uh, a large extent, but then elevate them in the way that you were just talking about. That's right. Have a mission. Yeah. Have a mission. Absolutely. So on that point, what is your, who do you admire from a leadership perspective? God, there's so many people. The, it's almost endless how many people I admire. Um, obviously from my father on onward, outward, uh, famous people that we've all heard of, obviously, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, Nelson Mandela. I mean, look at these people who are willing to suffer so much to do what was right, to make the world a better place. And then you go to people who were able to create great things, Steve Jobs. Look at, that's a man who, talk about resilient, getting fired from the job, from the company you founded by yeah. the guy you brought yeah. in. Yeah. I mean, could anything be worse than that? Um, and by the way, another one of those weird connections, you, you know, how things, you know, who you know, you know, Rick Appel being um, brother-in-law to Steve Jobs, Rick being a, a classmate of him. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, it's just weird, all these connections. You know, I'm beginning to think there aren't actually like 7 billion, 8 billion people on Earth. Can you keep like all the connections? It's weird that way. But well, anyway, back yeah. By the way, but that that's guys, there is some there's a lot of truth in that. This gets back to relationships again. The more relationships you make out there, you will be surprised at how many connect how many ways you can connect into other kinds of people. As long as you do it authentically, that could be very helpful to you. You know, it's like the six degrees of separation. It's totally. 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 Well, so what how do you describe your leadership style? Well, I try and be, uh, the most important thing is, uh, well, well, a couple of things. One, recognize you don't know everything. In fact, you know very little. So make sure you're not cautious about asking questions. That's really important. Ask has, that, questions. has that ever been tough for you to admit to yourself that you weren't aware of something and you had to rely upon others? Well, Yes, absolutely. And just to turn it a little bit, when you're younger, or at least for me, I shouldn't speak for others, but when I was younger, I was afraid to ask questions because they show how stupid I was, how I didn't know. And I was afraid. So they'd be like, something going on. I don't know what's going on. And I would just keep my mouth shut and like hope that somehow I'd clue into what it was or maybe somebody will 
somebody else will ask the question. Yeah. Now I have no problem now. I don't care if they think I'm stupid or not. I need to know this. Yeah, yeah. So that's one. The second thing is, and, and also is, when you are thinking you want to speak, think, do you really need to speak? You know that bit <laughs> from Hamilton? Remember that in Hamilton, the, in the play, in the, you know, where, you know, where the speak less, smile more, I believe is this thing. It's really helpful. And it's not just because you'll actually get some information, you actually, you know, it's good for you. The other thing is when you're a leader at any level of leadership, whether you're a parent, parent, you're a leader, any leadership level, what you say is going to influence the other people. So if you start speaking before everybody else had their chance, they're going to adjust what they say to match up to what you're saying. And you're not going to get the straight dope. Very right. important. By the way, that's, I think for everybody out there, that is a really important point. It's not a small point. It's a really big point that I need to follow more myself. My wife reminds me of that all the time, which is, and I'm, I'm serious about this and God bless her for that. Where, and go on, tell me if you agree with this. So as an example, in job interviews, listen to the person who is interviewing you. Um, ask them questions about themselves. Don't feel, don't keep talking. Like the more you talk sometimes, the less impact you will have in your job interviews. You, she always told me this, in interviews, the, um, the less you speak, and if the other person, the interviewer is speaking more than you are, it's probably a damn good interview. So do, do you agree with that? Well, I agree with that. And even more so the converse. When I talk to people and tell when they are interviewing a candidate, how important it is, let them speak. Yeah. Don't and yeah. don't talk about yourself or the company or or the job. Let them speak because it's, it's easy. You just want to talk about yourself sometimes, and that's not the purpose of an interview. Yeah. No, that's right. Okay. So we talked about and I, everybody. I'm going to get to your questions because there's a lot of questions, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, well, first, let's talk about about booking. So everybody's remote right now. Do you believe that once it's safe to go back into the water, that how do you see the, the situation being for employees within your massive company? Will it go back to the way it was or do you anticipate the workplace being different long-term? So work world is forever changed. The idea that people are gonna go five days a week into a separate location, and then at the end of the five days, they then will have two days where they are not in the location. And they, that is dead, never happening again, over. And here's the thing that's really interesting. So, and okay, and this is, this is, this is something that's uh, my wife, and I imagine many, many, many other uh, probably um, uh, parents, probably more likely uh, mothers, but fathers too, who are the, uh, who are the person responsible for childcare. And I've been saying for a very long time, if the schedule is more flexible, I could work from home more, then things would be better and all that in terms of child. And, and the companies have always said, no, no, that's never going to work. No, nah, that doesn't work. We all have to be in the business. We got to be there together. But lo and behold, if they said, oh, wait, yeah, maybe they were right. <laughs> it would work. And yeah. it, it will work. And so it's going it's to be different in different companies. And there's going to actually be a little bit of um, a sense of, is this fair or not? Because if you're on a factory uh, assembly line, you got to be there to assemble. But if you're a knowledge worker, you can be anywhere. So this separation between the have and have nots gets further apart. And that's going to yeah. be really interesting how that what how that plays out. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's so true. Are you surprised about how effective your company has been all working remotely? Is that I'm something? Shocked. I mean, I'm is shocked. that something you? If you were sitting here over a year ago, pre-pandemic, would you be thinking that you would be effective as a company if you had a much more flexible sort of hybrid situation? Well, we've talked about that a bit. And I've said, so imagine it's, um, you know, not a year ago, but a year and a half ago. And somebody comes to you with this plan of, instead of us all working in a, why don't we, you know, have some people work from home? And I say, well, that's interesting. I think it's pretty dumb. But okay, maybe maybe uh, we should do a study. 
So we'll have a bunch of people get together and there'll be a study for God knows how long it'll take and the unbelievable amount of effort will go into it. And they'll come back and say, man, it's probably not worth the risk. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it will be played. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Okay. Future of travel really briefly. Long-term permanent impacts from COVID. Do you anticipate like talk about just we have we have to be quick on this business travel, personal travel, business travel will be forever a smaller share of the total amount of travel. That is because we have just learned that we don't actually have to travel across the country for a two hour meeting. You and I could have this meeting like this. It's yeah. really going to stop a lot of uh incremental business travel. There'll be some, of course. And eventually, because all travel will grow, so business travel will be bigger than it was in 2019, but it'd be a smaller share of total travel, one. Two, which really, it's gonna change the economics because the airlines uh, made a lot of their profits from the people, what's known as the front of the bus, of course, the front of the plane, I don't know why it was this front of the bus. And that's the very expensive fares for the business class seat and the first class seat. That's where a lot of the airlines need most of their profits. That's not going to be there. And hotels that cater to business people paying really expensive, you know, um, average daily rates, call the amount of the how much it costs to go to the hotel. A lot of that's going to be cut back because people are not going to you know be spending that money. So the economics change a lot in the planes and yeah. the hotel. Okay, interesting. And then, um, how about the share economy? How does that impact you all? Like the, the rise of Airbnb and, and how more and more people are, people are increasingly finding those alternatives to be better for their, their, what their goals are for travel than being in large hotels. How does that impact, the share economy impact your company? Well, you know, we're the biggest player of both hotels and homes together. I mean, our business, we talked about about 30% of our, business, our room nights being um, homes. So... Hmm. What had been happening over many, many years is more and more people decided to use homes instead of hotels each year, a little bit more, a little more, a little more. Then pandemic happens and there's a giant step functional change because people feel a lot safer in a home than a hotel, naturally. And that's yeah. changed that. Now it will be forever be a, in the consideration set is people think about where do I want to go and what type of accommodation do I want? So that's going to be a bigger portion than it would have been otherwise. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I want to get to some other questions first from everybody. So that's, uh, I'm going to keep it to the top of the hour. So first of all, Connie says, I'm going to go through some of these things. Connie says, ah, love story. She's talking about the fact when you were, you brought your manuscript <laughs> to your future wife. Um, <laughs> let's, it, it, it is a great story. So Kurt asked, would you say that the relationships in this business and creative world are more important than actual skills. I go the other way. There are a lot of incredibly skillful, creative people, incredibly so. And you know, some of these TV shows you see, you know, America's Got Talent or pick any one of these things, how incredibly talented people there are around in creative ways, et cetera. But who becomes the star? Who becomes successful? Who's able to make a business, a, a, a living out of it? There's so many people who can sing and music and how many can actually make, you know, a business. Why? Well, it's not as though these are so much better than the other ones. It goes back to that serendipity part. And relationships. Well, the relationship comes from the serendipity of who you know, yeah. and whatever. So you need the basic. You got to have the quality to begin with. If you don't have the quality... You can have the greatest relationship in the world. If you can't sing, you're never going to be a singer. And, right. Or, or, right, right. You got to have you got to have the basic capabilities. But it is those relationships that help get you. You know, are the one differentiator that maybe maybe will get you the break, so to speak. And and that's one thing, guys. You know, the reason why we built this thing, my wife and I, and actually kids were involved in helping build this and and continue to grow this, is that we we want you all to have an opportunity to to get your first step along your journey. And you're all very qualified. There are a lot of qualified people out there. So how do you get yourself noticed ahead of others? It's the relationships. And so you already have a foot in the door. You, you're a step ahead by being involved in this. And you know, Glenn, we're, the, the most satisfying thing for, for Luis and I is that, for, is that we were, we placed something like 15 internships just, or this is organic. 
This is all organically done. And for all of you who are actively interested in more than just these great sessions, but want to get involved, we have to get to know you. We, and, and, and so get involved, be activists that way. Once we get to know you, you've established a relationship, you have a head start, and we will go to bat for you for sure. Um, and on that, Peter, and this is an important thing, and, what, and this is the unfairness of the world, is again, it's like somebody says, but I don't know anybody, how do I get started? And you know, for people, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. I got an email from somebody, CEO of a company in South America. His son just finished a university computer science person. He sees a job opening at our company in Amsterdam, wants to know is what should the kid do or not? So the fact this, this guy is lucky, his dad and I know each other and can give me that in, that relationship, and I can send the resume to the right part of the HR, where it is. These type of things are so easy if you have uh, a network. And again, that's the problem for people who don't have the networks, people who are first generation university, first, so many things, and it's so unfair. But that is what life is. I mean, we can't, uh, unfortunately, we, you and I, we can work to make it better, but we can't change the whole world. So that means that people just have to work harder. I was first generation college. My parents didn't have college degrees and such. I didn't know and, that. Yeah. So it is, it is really important, obviously, that if you're already disadvantaged because you don't have the relationship, you, don't, you just you got to work harder at building them. And um, I, it's not fair, but that's the way the world is. But you're listening, the fact that you're listening to Glenn saying that is already the, is already showing that you found a way to get in because now you are in this organization that we've created, which is for you guys. We want it to be valuable to you guys. So the relationship is there for your taking. We're there for you. Uh, so you have a step ahead. You've developed that or you have the opportunity to develop that. Anam asks, you identified early on the internet digital being the next frontier early on in your career. What do you identify as the next frontier now? All right. So the first thing is I felt I was behind terribly because uh -huh. things like Amazon had been out for five years. When I, in 2000, you know, Amazon started in 1995. Yahoo started in what, 95, 96. Now we're Yahoo now, of course. But there could go a whole bunch of things. So I thought I was behind, way behind. Yet they're always new things. So never feel like, oh, it's all over. I'm sure there's somebody after like Columbus landed in America, say, ah, all the exploration's done, nothing to do anymore. <laughs> um, and there is a tr story, but it's not true that, you know, there's only need for six computers when IBM came up with our first mainframe, but it's not a true story, but it says something. So here's the thing, what do I, I mean, there's so many new things coming down the road that you just are seeing. The stuff with the whole, um, biological changes with technology. So our vaccines, these mRNA vaccines that we have incredible in 10 months to have this, all about health is gonna be so different because of this genetic revolution that's happening. That's one right off the bat, it's gonna be so different going down the road. Um, there's still so many, I go a whole bunch of things. The job for everyone listening who's interested, you should be exploring and seeing and trying to figure out what you're most interested in and how things go. Look at things we have to do for becoming a greener a planet and all things are gonna to have to change there. Energy change that's gonna to have to happen. I mean, I, I can just go on and on. Agri uh, the, the world is open for change always. Your job is not to think, oh, it's all done. Your job is to go out and make it happen. Do you think um, for students out there, do you think it's in that kind of world that with the, the rate of change accelerating all the time, um, and with no end in sight. Do you have any kind of sense about pursuing an education and whether it's, I hate to use the word better, but uh, it's more productive for your long-term possibilities to be a generalist than a more narrowly focused in your education. Do you have any kind of guidance there or insights? So I'm asked that a lot. And the answer is, it depends on the person. It's not a very satisfactory answer, I know, but it means something. So for me, in my time, I studied business. I wanted to be in business. That's why I went and that's why I did it. My wife was an English major. She the entire separate, total generalist thing. She graduated. She had no idea what she wanted to do for a living. She really was clue, didn't, and she went to a great school, went to Cornell. And she's, you know, she didn't know, but she decided to go into journalism first, whatever. People will find their way. I, I have been a strong believer though. There is, because I just think it helps in terms of thinking. 
the sciences, math, things that actually are very, um, uh, let's say technically um, valuable, I believe, helps form a foundation for people many times in understanding our world. So I think that is important, but there also is communication so important. So in terms of, if you are a generalist, don't worry the fact, well, I don't have anything special. I'm not a CSE major. So therefore I can't get a job. That's absolutely not true. Right. Uh, no, I think that's that's all good advice. I, I One thing that I do emphasize to everybody out there and mostly a, a lot of the people out there are, are media entertainment kind of focused that what whatever, but it applies to everything. You have to, I think it's very important to have an understanding of the technology that's around you and where it's going. And so even if you consider yourself to be a creative it's critical for you to understand the technology and how it's transforming our worlds around us because that's a part of everything we do. Creating content, whatever, travel, how it's completely changed the everything. industry. Yeah, everything. Okay, so I'm not gonna ask Glenn the favorite memory of me, of with, being with me in law school. I'm not gonna ask that question. Um, that was on a <laughs> second question. Okay, so um, Christina asks, what, what are your, what are the, your insights? I think we covered this on the state of play regarding the future of business travel now that meetings and deals can be done so much more efficiently, cost effectively over Zoom. Well, I'll ask it this way because you kind of covered it. Do you believe that you can be as effective in business having these kinds of, these kinds of meetings? Depends on the purpose of the meeting. Okay. Sometimes, it, so really, when you're trying to do a, a sale or something, it's good to be in person. There's a lot of communication that's subtle, that doesn't come across well in a Zoom call, that you actually have to be in person to really clue in. Also, when you start getting to, I do a lot of international stuff. So culturally, it's harder to do Zoom stuff because all you're yeah. getting are the words for the most part. You're missing out on a lot of the nuances. Now, one thing about business that's important though is that I do believe that, and perhaps even more important, will be the big meetings, the conventions, the things when you get lots of people together, because it may be the first time you get together with lots of people at once until you value them higher. Um, I, that's gonna continue. You know, see uh, the big stuff in Vegas, that's gonna keep going. That's interesting because I think that's counterintuitive to a lot of people who feel that you can do, you know, there's all these virtual sorts of things that technology that's popping up to replace CES. But I agree with you, nothing, nothing, no kind of technology will ever um, overtake the power of the like in-person meeting somebody. You, I, and not what I think, I think it's critical to meet the person the first time, like in the same room together, tangibly, physically, but then you can have this kind of sustain the relationship, build it this way. Okay, we only have a, what's that? It can, CSE can be fun. Some of these big conventions, it's fun. Yeah, and fun is a good thing. It's an important part of bonding. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask you another question. Itchak it asked the question, on your journey to becoming CEO, did you ever deal with imposter syndrome? If so, what tips, suggestions would you have for overcoming it? Um, every single person who ever got to anywhere, for the most part, unless they're incredible, Ego manical, uh, manical uh, believes that you're an imposter. Everybody, everybody always feels that way. I am certain right now, President Biden is like, like I can't believe I'm president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am certain that's going on. Okay, sure. that's it. Now, so one thing people say is, you know, uh, I forget the woman who said this, but fake it till you make it was one thing. And the other thing is relaxing, don't worry about it. Every, you know, it's not a big deal. It's okay to not be certain you know how to do this. Feel comfortable that you don't need to know how to do everything perfectly. Yeah, but Glenn, I, I absolutely that's true. But it's a lot easier to say than to actually implement that. You know, especially if you're a thinker, like you're a thinker, you know, you're, I know your wheels are always turning. So how did you train yourself to feel comfortable with that? Because it's pretty daunting when somebody says, Glenn, anoints you the CEO of this massive company that is now worth a hundred billion dollars. That's a lot of things you need to know. So yeah. how did you get, how did you come to peace with that? 
Um, really just doing it day by day. So the first, certainly the first part, you're nervous and you're uncertain for a lot of things you've never done before. First time you do an earnings call and analysts are asking all sorts of questions and you are studying the night before the day before making sure you don't, it's like a pop quiz where you, you haven't, you haven't, you didn't go to class at all, you know, a whole semester and now they're going to ask yeah. you questions in public on, you know, from a lot of people. And, uh, you, you know, you say you're nervous, but after you do it for, uh, you know, I've, I've now been in this, I've now been CEO of Booking Holdings for over four years. So, you know, I've done, I've now done 17 earnings calls. So you finally start getting used to like anything. I imagine there are some people or performers who now they go out, it's completely relaxed, but the first time they played in front of a big crowd, I bet they're really, really nervous. Now, some people say they're still nervous, even though they've done thousands of shows. Yeah. I guess what kind of person you are. But once you start doing it, you're okay. Yeah. Well, listen, on that note, um, I, I'm going to let you go because you have a $100 billion company to run. And so I'm, I'm going to let you go. But Glenn, thank you. First of all, it's great to see you. It's, it's great always good to see you. Yeah, always good. And I can't wait till we can actually travel together again or travel out to see each other again. That'll be this fun. Summer. Time. Yeah, this, this summer. summer. This, this summer, summer will do but okay. really appreciate you supporting Creative University, making yourself available, invaluable advice. So thanks a lot, buddy. So good luck to everybody who is listening. I hope I've been helpful. Um, if not, send an email off to Peter and <laughs> he can forward it over to me. And Peter, thank you. Say hello to the family and everything. Talk to you later. Yeah, same. Okay, Glenn, I'm gonna let you go by right now and then I'm, I'll stick, stick around for people to ask questions. Bye-bye, right. everybody. All right, see you, Glenn. Thank you so Bye. much.